good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is you have joined us. We're glad you're here. I'm the Reverend Cheryl Butler, and this is Journey Road Ministries, where we seek to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. So the scripture from the gospel today is from Matthew chapter 13, 31 through 33, and 44 to 52, if you would love to follow along in your Bible. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in, the, in this field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets but threw out the bad. So what will be at the end of the age? The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. May God bless the reading and the hearing of the word. Now we have the Reverend Mary Dyer who will share with us today um, her thoughts of the kingdom. Today I have titled this homily Naked Athena. I hope that captures your interest and curiosity. The gospel today is a series of the kingdom of God is like images. We have the mustard seed, the yeast rising, the pearl, the treasure, the net. The first two, the mustard seed, seemingly inevitably growing into a large plant that could shelter many things, and the baker woman kneading the bread, seem very sure and certain. Plant a seed, it grows to maturity. Make bread. It rises perfectly. The other three, the, the selling of everything to hopefully buy a pearl of great price. The merchant doing the same to buy a field in which he hoped lay a treasure chest full of jewels. And the fisherman casting a net into the sea to pull it up and not until then knowing whether or not he had a catch. They seem to carry a bit more of uncertainty about the results. And yet, I'm a gardener. And I know that not every seed that I plant is going to germinate or is going to grow to maturity or is not going to be attacked by an animal or some sort of disease or virus or even trampled on inadvertently. And I also know, having made bread, that the yeast doesn't always rise the way I wanted it to. And 
the bread doesn't taste as heavenly as I had initially imagined. So I want to clump those five together briefly in that we understand that there is an element of risk and leaving something to get something better, even in planting a seed and in kneading the dough. So we need to figure out what we do when we are in that in-between time or something that has happened and something that we want to happen. And so I do want to focus primarily on the seed, however. As you know, we're still in a perfect storm of COVID and BLM and unemployment. It's so easy just to get over one. Where do we put our energies? Do we even have any energy left? Will it even make a difference? Haven't we all wondered these things? Sometimes I feel like just staying in bed or not watching the news and going la 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 because I, I simply can't take it anymore. And so let's talk a little bit about this kingdom that Jesus promises. Actually, I prefer the word kingdom rather than kingdom and it has become popular among many clergy and theologians. Kingdom, even the kingdom of God, applies to hierarchy. You know, somebody's lower, somebody's higher, and that stays. Uh, but kingdom talks more about the community of all of us together, working together, praying together, and living together. And so that is what we pray for when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come or thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we can't escape and stay in bed every day or put our hands over our ears every day because we are commanded by the prayer that virtually any Christian knows by heart to be part of this kingdom on earth. And so getting back to the gardening metaphor, I'm a master gardener and had my own landscaping business for a few years and have a, actually have a horticultural certificate. And I learned there that there are two kinds of seeds. One's called the angiosperm and one called the gymnosperm. The angiosperm is the one that has the seed inside a protective covering so that it is much less likely to be broken open or eaten or devoured or die before it's actually planted and germinates. The other one I find more interesting is called the gymnosperm, which is Greek for a naked seed. That seed has nothing to protect it or cover it, simply its own self, its own kernel waiting to spring open. So, I think of us as gymnosperms, that we can't walk around wrapped up and covered up and protected. This is time to, to be open, to be vulnerable, to confront the forces of evil, the forces of power with our true naked selves, unadorned with anything that we may have accrued that is not necessary to building the kingdom of God. No artificial protections, no weapons, no armor, just open arms, hands outstretched to face all those powers of destruction that are in full body armor, literally, with loaded guns and tear gas, and to look at the future with new eyes, new hearts, new social structures and human connections. Although I now live in Iowa, I am from Oregon, so I've been following closely the news of the protests that have been happening in Portland, the city that is very dear to my heart. The protests that were initiated and sparked by the murder of George Floyd. They have been primarily peaceful, but every day and every night people come out in unison to gather together to protest this kind of violence focused primarily on, on the, um, the black community. And so there, was, there has been some vandalism, I'm not gonna deny that, but 
99% of the people that have come out are peaceful. They come out with no weapons, with hands open and with hearts open and with eyes open. So even the mayor and the governor have asked the White House to take away its hired troops. Uh, uh, the private army that has no insignia or name tags, and they're fully armed with rifles and shields and face masks and tear gas to, as the Department of Homeland Security says, proactively subdue the crowd. They started arbitrarily advancing on peaceful protesters, knocking them down, beating them, gassing them, grabbing some and shoving them into unmarked vans to take them to undisclosed locations with no specific charges leveled against them. Both the governor and the mayor have asked Trump to pull back these Gestapo-like troops that are rampaging through Portland in the way of keeping peace when they're actually agitating. So some Portland moms finally being horrified at this horrendous and unconstitutional abuse of power decided to step up and step in. And they formed a line of mothers with masks because not to hide their identity, but to, because of the coronavirus. So they were trying to be together while not communicating a possibly fatal disease. And with signs and with linked arms to stand between the other protesters and this new American Gestapo. They were tear gassed, but they keep coming back stronger every night to continue their protests against the police violence. Then on July 18th, an unidentified woman pushed her way in the front of the crowd. She proceeded to sit down on the curb in front of the crowd and facing the line of the Gestapo. She was wearing a mask, so no one could tell who she was, and a stocking cap, and that was all. She was totally naked. I expect your first reaction might be shock, maybe even judgment or condemnation. She was sitting down, legs spread, arms apart, hands outstretched to this line of thugs that were heavily armed. It is a very provocative picture. It both mimics the act the generative act itself, and also the act of giving birth. A beautiful younger woman, naked in front of armed men. And yet, wouldn't it be more fitting to have the reaction to the unnamed armed forces with their riot shields and their pepper spray and their gas masks and rifles and batons? And she stayed there for a while, just simply staring at them, immobile, her arms outstretched. And then, still naked, of course, she stood up and danced gracefully, purposefully, powerfully. In all their armor, all their bullets, all their pepper gas were totally useless, this beautiful woman showing what truth after she finished, she disappeared, unnamed, still unidentified as far as I know, into the crowd. Soon the press started calling her the naked Athena. Her photo has gone around the world. Just type in naked Athena in your Google search and you will see her. And the press dubbed her Athena because Athena was the Roman goddess of war as this photo of her statue shows. Mm. 
what a difference. This statue shows us what a true warrior looks like. Battle dress, spear, sword, helmet, even an eagle sitting on her shoulder, the royal eagle. Or is it? Our faith comes from our following Jesus. It's easy to think of him as an infant, you know, being held lovingly in his mother's arm, nursing him in the stable in Bethlehem. It's also easy to think of him on the morning of the resurrection, breaking the bonds of death and descending later into heaven, where he waits for us also with loving arms. But it's really not very easy to look at the depictions, some very realistic, of Jesus hanging on the cross, exposed for all to see. So hard, in fact, that for millennia, artists were afraid to show him as he actually was. As the following painting will illustrate, he was more exposed, in fact, than in virtually all the other artistic representations of him. He, like other prisoners hanging on the Roman cross, was totally naked. No loincloth, just as naked as the day he was born. It was the ultimate humiliation the Roman government could inflict on a prisoner to take away any shred of dignity, including the loincloth that appeared in representations, because that truth of his vulnerability and nudity was deemed too hard for us to witness even in artistic works. And yet with the addition of a loincloth, we hang the crucifix itself in many churches, proclaim that it was the ultimate acceptance and vulnerability that led to resurrection in a new form, that no earthly power could separate him or us from the love and power of God. With new friends in Kenya, who had been reading the autobiography of Wangari Mathai, a Kenyan woman who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1994. She is probably mostly known for beginning the Green Belt Movement, working with other Kenyan women to reforest Kenya, the axis of Western development and greed, having over-harvested large sections of the countryside. And yet she was also awarded this coveted prize for working for democracy, peace and the advancement of women's rights. In 1993, she stood with many other grandmothers who, after being repressed by the Moy regime in their quest to have their political prisoners free, their sons and grandsons, most of them finally decided to raise the stakes and protest naked. This willingly stripping has been long a work of those that are really open to putting everything on the line for what they believe in. Although I do expect that the shock of seeing a naked Kenyan grandmother is a bit less than the first one that I showed you. The first was of a very beautiful, much younger woman. And here we see the grandmothers. And yet the message is the same. True power is not found in arms, in bullets, in shields, and force, but being open and vulnerable and exposed, all of us together ready for a new creation. Renee Brown summarized this task before us this year in these challenging times in an earlier statement of hers.
A wise Jewish rabbi thousands of years ago said much the same thing as she much later did. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. You may have heard of him. His name is Jesus. So it is coming time to close. One last quote, then a children's song that expresses how we work together generation to generation to generation to plant seeds of hope and power. In Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front, written by Wendell Berry, one of my favorite American poets, these lines begged to be written aloud here. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is a measure. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. And now let us end. I spent a long time running, I never knew then what I know I know now. That the fruits, they always come in, but you can't go around just knocking them down. It takes a long time to show in, we plant the seeds then and we look at them now. But the roots are always growing, no matter if I'm there or never around. Whatever grows will grow, whatever dies will die, whatever works will work, whatever flies will fly, whatever fails will fail, what's meant to soar will soar, I am planting seeds, nothing It's like your whole life, you've been training for this moment, and when the time comes, you just disown it, meaning you just surrender, don't control it, not interested in the clay pots and mold it, or sitting next to the path trying to unfold it, or waiting for the fruits to fall down toward you, let it go and now you're flowing, feeling quite gorgeous, so you take steps away instead of towards it, what a rush, feeling freedom with nothing to hold, we've been taught that what you touch will always turn to gold, and now we're learning when we let it go, it overflows with no credit to take, cause no credit is home, a higher power working deeper where the seeds are sowed, and when the seeds are true, then there's seeds of gold, but the real gold is joy when life starts to flow, and when it does, you just smile cause now you know, I spent a long time running, I never knew then what I know I know now Let the fruits they always come in But you can't go around just knocking them down It takes a long time to show in We plant the seeds then and we look at them now But the roots are always growing No matter if I'm there or never around Whatever dies will die, whatever works will work, whatever flies will fly, whatever fails will fail, what's meant to soar will soar. I am planting seeds Whatever grows, yep. will grow. when it grows, it grows dies, And when it dies, it dies, come on works, If it works, it works Whatever flies, will Let it fly, let it fly fails, will fail. When it fails, it fails meant to soar, will soar. When it soars, it soars. I am planting seeds Whatever grows, will grow. let it grow, let it Whatever grow. dies, will die. it dies, it dies Whatever works, will grow. When it works, it works Whatever flies, yeah. will fly. Let it fly, let it Whatever fly
when you smile, it just gives up someone to know that they, you're caring about and that you love them. <laughs>